اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Dear Professor شفة المرزانة Faculty of Usul Deen and Islamic Thought State Islamic University Sunan Kalijaga Yogyakarta Indonesia our professors and doctors, our lecturers and student, postgraduate student, our participant here in ISTAC, IIUM, in Malaysia and other parts of the world, we welcome you once again to our 20th ISTAC professorial, world professorial lecture with our professor, uh, Dr. Sifatun, insha'Allah. Brothers and sisters, dear professors and doctors, all the participants in the Zoom, in the YouTube, and here in ISTAC, in Ibn Khaldun conference room, this is our 20th ISTAC World Professorial Lecture. Alhamdulillah, in one year, and so we managed to have 19 World Professorial Lectures of ISTAC. Starting from the first World Professorial Lecture presented by uh, Tansri, uh, Emeritus Professor Tansri Zulkifli Abdul Razak, the Rector of IIUM, on the new model of the university the world is looking for in a very complex world and followed by Professor uh, by lectures or professorial lectures presented by great scholars from IIUM, Malaysia, and overseas, and also presented by ambassadors, uh, experts in the United Nations, uh, prime ministers, and uh, one of the lecture was presented by the prime minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, here uh, in IIUM in ISTAC and many others. Alhamdulillah, today we are, uh, we invited our scholar, uh, Professor uh, Sifatun to present one of the uh, ISTAC professorial lectures uh, in one of the most important and pressing uh, topics, especially in our present time uh, in Malaysia here, in Indonesia and elsewhere in the world, this question of the importance of spirituality and ethicality for interreligious and civilizational dialogue, the way forward in a complex world is very uh, timely, brothers and sisters. Uh, it is really great honor for us to have Professor uh, Sifatun as one of the uh, speakers in this platform of ISTAC World Professorial Lecture. And um, many of us know the uh, scholarship of Professor Dr. Sifatun Mirzana uh, as our moderator, Dr. Norul Ain Norman will uh, introduce her to you uh, shortly, inshallah. It is uh, indeed uh, a great uh, time and a great uh, session today, having uh, our professor and also the topic. I would like to thank once again all the participants who are here in ISTAC and also uh, in the Zoom and in the YouTube and those who are with us here now and those who will be uh, joining us inshallah. Uh, without any delay, I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Norul Ain Norman, our moderator today, who is a lecturer. Uh, in uh, the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, IIUM, here. 
Dr. Nurul Ain, please go ahead. Okay, Professor Aziz, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Our respected Dean, Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz Yadod, Honorable Professor Dr. Shafaatim Al-Mirzana from Faculty of Al-Suradim and Islamic Art, State Islamic University, Sunan Kalijaga, Yogyakarta, Jakarta, Indonesia, by LUM UMC members, deans and directors, academic and administrators, distinguished professors, doctors, scholars, researchers, IIUM staff students, and others from all parts of the world. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to the 20th staff world professor lecture today. We, we are delighted to have you all here again, whether physically or virtually, gracing our 20th session for today. And we want to thank you for your constant support since day one. And we're honored to have a special guest from the Republic of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Jafarudin Al-Nuzana, for accepting our invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an increasingly popular issue today is dialogue among the followers of different religions. Human beings are living in a, in a global world with diverse uh, ethnicities, religions, and cultures, and interreligious dialogue is, a, is vital for maintaining harmony and peaceful coexistence. And today, we will discuss on the spiritual and ethical aspect of it. The topic of our 20th uh, IWPL is the importance of spirituality and ethicality for interreligious and civilizational dialogue, the way forward in a complex world. And we have here today Professor Dr. Shafa Atim Al Mirzana from Faculty of the Suladin and Islam Class State Islamic University Sunan Kalijaga, Yogyakarta, Indonesia, to give valuable insight, insights on this. Shafa Atun obtained her PhD in theology from Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, 2008, with distinction dissertation entitled When Mystic Masters Meet towards a new matrix for Christian Muslim dialogue. She also has a Doctor of Ministry on Spirituality from Catholic Theological Union Chicago. She has a double master's degree from theology from the same previous university and a philosophy MA degree from the Islamic University Kale uh, Sunan Kalijaka, where she had worked on Ibn Khaldun on Sufism. She started her career at Sunan Kalijaga University since 1990 and is still an ongoing professor there. She was the research coordinator for the Institute for Interfaith Dialogue in Indonesia from 1996 to 2001. A year after 96, she was accepted as a visiting professor of Islamic studies at Sanata Dharma Catholic University in Yogyakarta, where she published a book with Father Tom Michael who wrote What Should Non-Christians Know About Christian Christianity, which was used in Manila, Philippines. Interestingly, her book was given the title What Should Non-Muslims Know About Islam. In 1998, she went to Netherlands and Egypt, where she was the scholar in residence <laughs> at uh, Utrecht University and stayed uh, at the Catholic Catholic Semenyar Nadi K. Cairo, Egypt. She also held the position of the research coordinator for Center for Women's Studies at State and the Secretary of the Department of Comparative Religion, State Islamic University, Sunan Kalijaga, till 2000 and 2001, accordingly. Shafa Adun had the opportunity to fly back to the States in 2008, where she was appointed as the adjunct professor at the university where she pursued her study at, and later in 2016, where she was honored as a full right visiting professor at Eastern Mennonite University, Virginia. And in 2011, as a visiting associate professor at Georgetown University, Washington, DC. At the latter location, she held the Malaysian Chair for Islam in Southeast Asia at Al Wali Pintala Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. I have a long list of what she has been positioning over the years, and it shows how, how great she is. So let me just quickly go through it. She was the editorial board member of an international university, an international journal, HTS Theological Studies. She was the reviewer for Studia Islamica, also the Timbalan Panila Yalavan, Academic Dosen UIN, uh, mm -hmm. Sunan Kalijaga, 
who was the director of the uh, directorate of academic affairs of UI Student Student Alijada, board member of Central Asia Production Research Chicago. She was also the director of the Center for Religion and Science State of uh, Student College, a member of Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities Medical School of University of Jogjamada, Jogjamada. She is not, uh, she is now not only teaching uh, Uwe Sunan Kalijaga, uh, she is also teaching University, university Taja Maja Jogjakarta and also Paramedina University on religion, interreligious and, and inter, uh, intercultural dialogue, human rights, human dignity, bioethics, mysticisms, and so on. Not to be forgotten, her professional affiliations from the following, from American Academy of Religion, UK and U USA's Indian Arabic Society, UK's Eckhart Society, US Fellowship of Reconciliation, and one from the Association for Asian Studies, Michigan. She was also part of the Committee of Ethics in the Medical and Health Research Faculty of Medicine, University Gajah Mada, Jakarta. She was given many, many awards, fellowship <coughs> and awards, including the Ambassador for Peace by Universal Peace Federation, Washington, D.C., and translation grants from McGill University. The books that she has translated are Women in Confucianism, Women in Hinduism by Catherine Young and uh, Mir Shaloya, The Reality of the Secret from Daniel Powell's book, Seven Theories of Religion. Her writings, mashallah, are unbelievable. Near to 20 books on religion, hermeneutics, religious moderation, terrorism, women, and peace, and near to 15 journal articles on ethics, bioethics, Ibn Khaldun, Christian Islam, polarism, and etc. Articles and books where many of them are on interfaith areas and non ending op eds and you know, uh, in newspapers. Without further ado, I take pleasure to invite Professor Dr. Shafa Atun Al Mirzana to, to deliver her talk. Please. Okay. Thank you, sister. Oh, that's too much, I think. <laughs> you don't need to read all uh, my uh, CV. Anyway, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, ladhi khulakul insana min alak, wa ja'alahu fi ahsani taqwim, fil khulki wal akhlaq, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-tahirina ala syirki wa nifak. Amma ba'du. Uh, thank you so much, Sukran Jazilan, for the invitation, uh, Professor Abdul, Abdul Aziz. I'm honored to be here, actually. And also, thank you so much for uh, Professor Osman Bakar, who introduced me to uh, Professor Abdul Aziz. Distinguished scholar of uh, all the participants here. Uh, let me share something with you. Uh, actually, I have my own a, a title, but that's included in what the team that I have to speak about. So uh, let me share immediately right now, I think. Oh, sorry, why is this? Okay. I need to close this first, okay. Okay. This is why when we have a lot of stuff in our computer, so, <laughs> okay. 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 Here is my title. I will speak about Sufism as rich resources for interpreting tradition. And I think as you asked me to speak about, I will talk also how the Sufism, or I mean here a, a mystical hermeneutic has the relevance for the contemporary discourse on peaceful coexistence. Before that, I will speak first about the element of religion before entering into what Sufism, how Sufism or mysticism can be a rich resources for the inter, for interpreting tradition. So I will put three four elements that I quote from uh, a distinguished Catholic theology, 
theologian Frederick von Hugel. In his monumental study, The Mystical Element of Religion, he said that all living religions embody a unity of three elements. The first one is the historical institutional. This one addressed to mind and memory. And this is what the most of us often equate with religion. So we have a building, like we have a church, mosque, synagogue, and people that we can see, and also creed that we, prof that we profess, etc. This actually is only one element of religion that is belong to a historical institutional. And then the second one is the intellectual or the analytic speculative, which is associated with reason. And this element of religion is operative when we try to make sense or talk about our faith. This is the second element. And the third element that we are going to talk about in this conference is the experiential or the mystical. This is what we call intuitive, emotional, which direct to the will and the action of love. Almost in the same manner here, uh, one of the, the scholar from uh, uh, a Jewish tradition, a scholar of Jewish mysticism, Gershom Shalom. He also almost uh, said the same thing here. He said that the religion developed in three stages. One is mythical, second one is institutional and the mystical. What I want you to uh, see here, uh, I, want, I want you to, to really, uh, what is it, uh, have a, have a, what is it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I want you to, to see here is that these three elements, so this mystical, uh, mythical, institutional, and mystical have to be in mutual and harmonious relationship in order for religion to flourish. So if our religion need to flourish, we have to be, uh, to make these three elements of religion in harmonious relationship and in mutual relationship. So when one aspect, for example, we just, maybe we, we only focus on one element like institutional that actually we are doing right now. So when one aspect is ignored in the expense of, in the, expense of the other, in the expense of the other, or when a unbalance of the application of this aspect occur, conflict will be unavoidable. So this is actually, according to me, in, in my perspective, you may also not agree with me. This is what happened uh, uh, today because we ignore other, ex other aspect. We ignore uh, other element. We just focus on one aspect and ignore other aspect or in, or in the expense of the other aspect. Maybe we just, uh, what is it? Focus on institutional that we mentioned before, historical institutional. So we have big mosques, big church, big synagogue, and huge uh, people that follow our religion, something like that. But we ignore the intellectual and experiential or mystical element. So this is what happened uh, today. So we have something uh, maybe uh, occur in our uh, country or in our tradition. Okay, why I choose mysticism? Why mysticism? Why Sufism? In the past, mysticism and mystic have been relegated to one of the two categories. Either that of the spiritual elite who embody the deepest form of faith, but who have little in common with ordinary life and the vast majority of the core regionaries, or that of the eccentric spiritual friends whose ideas and practices border to the her on heretical. Maybe some people consider a Sufi as a heretic. But today, mysticism and mystic formally assigned to the friends have come to be seen in the new light. Both scholar and general public have come to perceive in the teaching and life of certain mystic a profound relevancy to the effort of mainstream believer to integrate the challenges of pluralism that we are talking about right now into their own religious identities. 
So for example, Delphi Tracy, this is a professor in my university in Chicago, sees in the mystic tradition a means for analogically participating in pluralistic dialogue on religion. The same also Hans Kuhn, who come to Indonesia very often, in establishing a common understanding with Eastern religion, he has turned to Christian mysticism or Christian mysticism negative theology. On the popular side, this interest is mirrored by, for example, the fact that English translation of the poetry of 13th century Persian Sufi writing in central Anatolia, Jaluddin Rumi, all of you maybe know about him, were the best selling poetry in the United States. So this is the, the reason why I choose Sufism or mysticism. But besides that also, religion will be an empty shell without Sufism. So I quote from uh, Anne Lewin Bar Barstow. She said, taking away a living spirituality at its core, religion will be inevitable, be reduced to an empty shell. So today, religion must incorporate mysticism or die because it will be barren, it will reduce to an empty shell. Especially in the case of Islam that we are talking about here, it is this aspect of traditional Islam, that is Sufism, buttressed by spiritual values that constitute the most important and effective bulwark against all forms of extremism, masquerading as Islam. This is why I choose uh, Sufism. And besides that also, I consider here, when we talk about the image of God, instead of perceiving God as distant that we usually do, distant, dominating, and powerful ruler whose command must be obeyed, the Sufi maintain the mercy, love, the gentleness, and the operating reality of existence. So for Sufi, God is not primarily a stern and forbidding father, but a warm and loving mother. This is I quote from uh, Sachiko Murata. So again, why mysticism? Sufi or mystic is someone who is ideally able to go beyond the phenomenal world on her or his journey to God into the deeper and enormous experience of unity. So they can move from a specific way, of, specific way of life into a more holistic one. The perspective, this is why I use it, the perspective and principle born from, from a spiritual insight of mystic masters are not only compelling and illuminating, but also they are timeless. And if, if we use slang language, for example, or today's language, of uh, what is that young people language. Mystic is someone who has an opportunity or has an access to download more meaning. This is why I, I say it is a re resources for interpreting tradition. Using the interpretation, but using interpretation adapted by those mystic, those the most step in spiritual and mystical tradition of Islam and other religion, that is Sufism or mysticism, I don't mean it to deny the importance of the other exegetical genre, like linguistic, legal, philosophical, or theological, because it has its place in the overall metric of interpretation and application. But we are today, I think, as, uh, as Dr. Uh, Abdul Aziz mentioned, maybe we are today more urgently in need of a return to the spiritual source of Islam or other religion than ever before. The special attention should be paid to mystical, spiritual and metaphysical dimension of revelation and to those authorities within the tradition who probe and disclose the depth of meaning within the scripture. Before continuing it or to that, I will mention some of the perspective about uh, fundamentalism, that's why I think um, uh, later on I will use this concept, this mysticism concept can be one way to reduce or to uh, at least eliminate this fundamentalist uh, uh, perspective. 
So according to William Eggington, in his book, In Defense of Religious Moderation, I met him in um, Maryland, I think, when I was in Georgetown University, that I promised him I will, inter I will uh, translate his book here into Indonesia because I think this book is very important for us. So he said fundamentalists can be religious, but they don't have to be. The only thing required to be a fundamentalist is to believe that there is only one way of knowing the word and that any other way must be wrong. So that why fundamentalists, not only uh, uh, between religious people, but also non-religious people can be fundamentalists. If they see that there is only one way of knowing the word and that any other way must be wrong. But contrary to that, moderate belief deeply in their religions, in this social practices and in the trust of science, they just don't feel that those belief practices or truths represent some ultimate immutable knowledge. But these moderate believers, instead they recognize that different kinds of knowledge come from different sources. So that's why they are not fundamentalists because they believe there are something that, that can come from other, uh, uh, what is it, resources. So he also mentioned about what he called everyday fundamentalists. Belief, he actually, why fundamentalists is there because they believe in the code of code. What is that? It is a belief that the word as, the word as it really is in itself already exists as a kind of knowledge, independent of the ways we may come to know it. So according to um, Eggington, he said this is the basic, the basic ingredient of all fundamentalists, either religious or non-religious. So we are fundamentalists, whenever we treat our knowledge not as a model or version of reality, but as a reality itself. So fundamentalism can be in our everyday life. Okay, so now what about moderate believers and how will it defend against fundamentalism? Religious moderation, is a kind of religious belief that refuses the logic of the court of court that we mentioned before. So moderate believer find comfort, solace, community, and pressure in their belief system and the practices that accompany them, accompany them, but they never assume that this belief represent a direct, unfettered, and in or in some way absolute knowledge of the of the word. I don't know if this concept if, uh, uh, has a differences with what our, what is that, Minister of, of, of Religion in, in Indonesia also, uh, what is it, has this concept. Moderate belief or others perfectly capable, here yeah, I think this is more, the more important, perfectly capable of reciting the tenets of their own faith without ever feeling that they are in irresolvable contradiction with other, perhaps more practical way of understanding the word. So for this very reason, not only that these moderate believers, not only that such form of belief entirely compatible with scientific knowledge, but they are also inherently tolerant. I think this is what we call the ethic in uh, ethicality, right? In, in your team here. Since moderate believers make a constant practice of reconciling apparently incompatible version of reality. So this implicit commitment to tolerance, along with its suspicious of claim to ultimate knowledge make religious moderation one of the best possible defense against fundamentalism of all kinds. In particular, the religious fundamentalism that are so openly threatening the modern democratic worldview right now that we mentioned before. So still William Eggington, he said, contrary to what critic of religion often argue, 
for Eggington, the content of religious doctrine is not what make believe or tune to violate. He said the Quran is no more violent than the Bible. So whether believe or translate, this is what usually people said that maybe they translated wrong. So whether the believers translate the practices and belief into a reason for committing violence against the other, that's according to William Eggington, depend on a complex series of factors from socioeconomic deprivation to individual psychopathology. I will and I will add more for, uh, for this later. So he said, while religious indoctrination can be one of those factors, the sort of tolerance emphasized by religious moderate discourage vindictive judgment and fosters instead a willingness to search for more for common ground for understanding. So I think I will just uh, pass this toleration. I think we already know. So this is what I mentioned that I will add more for, uh, for a kingdom because the cause of conflict that leading or conflict or intolerance that leading to conflict actually is more than just religious reason. So I said here, there are many that we can account for the cause of this conflict and intolerance leading to conflict. As William A. Kingdon already mentioned, economic, social, and politic. And I add one more. I said, but one of the cause I believe is religious illiteracy or sometimes we call religious ignorance, religious illiteracy. I am not talking about the very uninformed of other religious tradition. I also believe that some of them are not well informed or illiterate about their own tradition. Not, about, not only about other religious tradition, but even their own tradition. So chair of the department of uh, religion at Boston University, Stephen Portero, for example, he mentioned in his article, the title is Worshipping in Ignorance. I'm wondering that we are also worshipping in ignorance. And in his book, Religious Literacy, What Every American Need to Know and Doesn't, he said how little most Americans know about the most rudimentary teaching and practices in the word religion. So this is what we call illiterate about our own tradition. So I am wondering that we are both deeply religious, but at the same time also maybe profoundly ignorant about tradition, about our religion. This, I am sure that the participant of intolerance that led to, conf to uh, violence also, they know next to nothing about other religious tradition they are opposed to, that they don't like it, or that they they opposed to their religion. Because it is common in many religious traditions that, ex that exclusivist tendencies are likely to be uninformed from within. This actually from my dissertation, from my book that published in, in uh, United States, uh, uninformed from within as well as from viva. What I mean by this, uninformed from within means that they are usually deaf to alternative interpretative possibilities from inside their own tradition. Because we have many possible interpretation, but these uninformed people from within, they don't want to hear. So they, they, they are deaf to this alternative. This is what I mean by uninformed from within. And uninformed from without means they are usually articulated with little to no experience. This is what we call non next to nothing. With little to no experience of genuine encounter with the other. Or if there is experience of the other, it is short lived and highly negative. So this is why. I wrote the book, maybe uh, because this is in Indonesia, so you cannot, I don't know if you can uh, read it. The title is When Mecca Become Las Vegas. Ketika Mecca Menjadi Las Vegas. In this book, I deal with the tendencies toward a literal and formalist understanding of religion in Indonesia in relation to the rise of intolerance among some religious people. Psychologically speaking, human beings tend to organize their environment in a very simple cognitive structure. 
it seems that human beings need a cognitive closure that is an exact answer to certain problem and opposed to confusion and ambiguity. So this one, the cognitive clausure, clausure and opposed to confusion and ambiguity, this is the characteristic of much of the fundamentalists that we mentioned already. <clears throat> Besides that, Jungian personality theory mentioned two basic types of human being. This is what I talk in my book, concretist and intuitive. That is abstract or intuitive and concrete or objective. Objective or certainly seeking. The intuitive person, usually people with social sciences and art background, tend to be more creative in solving problems. They are more creative. They explore feeling and instinct and has new ideas that are more imaginative, problem-oriented and subjective. This is the intuitive person. Contrary to that, on the other hand, the concretists prefer to concrete way of perceiving the world, perhaps simple and possibly simplistic and strongly solution-oriented. For the intuitive, they are problem-oriented, but for the concretists, they are solution-oriented. So consequently, many people find it is difficult to, find, to face change in their life for concretists. They are relatively less equipped to solve an abundance of choices. Even, for example, like maybe a lot of choices is frightening. For concretists, too many choices can be overwhelming and even frightening. For concretists, it is for the, this reason that religious fundamentalism, or in this case, concretists, for example, is very attractive to the concretists. A lot of fundamentalists coming from this kind of concretist community, concretist people, concretist type of people. They are engaged in monodimension, monodimensional or literalist reading of scripture, which contrasts to those intuitive group who have been trained to approach the tech in multi-dimensional approaches. So this is a big difference. One fundamentalist prefer monodimension or literalist. The other one intuitive, they approach the tech in multi-dimensional approaches. For fundamentalists, why they, they prefer concrete is because for fundamentalist uncertainty is very unsatisfying. For fundamentalists, in this case also concrete, is tend to seek an ideological or religious system that satisfied, satisfies with no ambiguities, no equivocation, no reservation, and no criticism. And why it is, it is uh, what is that lead to violent radicalism? Everything considered to be in opposition to what they said or to the concrete belief can provoke aggression. So unlike postmodern thought, for example, that does not believe in certainty, individual with fundamentalist mentality in this case, concretist mentality, will have an overwhelming desire for certainty and at the same time will actively look for the power to enforce that certainty to others. This is why this formalistic understanding of fundamentalist mentality can lead to violent radicalism because they look for the power to enforce that certainty to others. No, I will come again to mysticism and I will, what is it, offer the perspective how to deal with this. So there is a, what we call fourfold typology of medieval exegesis. This is why I, I said mysticism or suism is a resources for interpreting tradition. I quote from Michael Fishpen in his book, Garment of Torah, he said in his essay, The Teacher and the Hermeneutical Task, a reinterpretation of medieval exegesis. Michael Fishpen, this is the 
the man, makes reference to the fourfold typology of medieval scriptural interpretation common to both Jewish and Christian tradition. After this, I will mention in Islamic tradition also that almost similar to this tradition. What is the fourfold typology? This is what he called in Jewish exegetes. This typology took the form of the acronym Pardesh. P as Peshat, it means literal meaning. Literal meaning. And then uh, R as Remes, the allegorical meaning. D address, the tropological and moral meaning. And the last one, sort as sort the mystical meaning. If you want to look, you can see from his book, Carmen of Torah. It says in biblical hermeneutic. So according to him, the tradition of rab rabbinic mystical exegesis is known as sort, this is mystical tradition, mystical hermeneutic, turn on the principle that the word of secret scripture speak to the reader without ceasing. I think this is interesting. I think this is why this tradition can have rich resources and can also help us to solve the problem on this discourse how to, uh, to be in peaceful uh, existence here. So he said, there is a continual expression of the text, and this is not only revealed itself in the ongoing in reinterpretation, but and it is more than the eternity of interpretation from the human side. It also points to the divine mystery of speech and meaning. This is what, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Michael Fisben said. So, according to him, there is a prophetic task. We have this kind of prophetic task of breaking the idol of simple sense and restoring the mystery of speech to its transcendent role in the creation of human reality. So each of us has this prophetic task, actually. This is interesting for me. Fisben said that one of the primary function of mystical exegete, like Ibn Arabi in our tradition that I will mention to you as an example, and also in Christian tradition, we have Master Eckhart as like in my dissertation. This is what he said that this is the primary function of mystical exegete is to continue this prophetic mission because we have this prophetic task, prophetic mission. It is in the service of thought that is mystical exegesis that mystical exegete mediate the multitude of interpretation as they resist the dogmatization of meaning and the eclipse of the divine light of speech. They don't want dogmatization of meaning. It should be, it should be a multitude of interpretation. So breaking the idol of simple sense. This is the prophetic mission, according to Fishman. So as mystic, mystical exegetes, mystics seek to transcend the idolatries of language and condemn hermeneutical arrogance in all its form. This what he said as prophetic mission. I think I agree with this. So now I give an example in Islamic tradition, Ibn Arabi. According to him, According to Ibn Arabi, he is my master. Each word of the Quran, not to mention it verses and chapters, according to him, each word of the Quran has an unlimited meaning, unlimited meaning, and all of which are intended by God. So, according to him, correct recitation of the Quran allows the reader to access new meaning at every reading. So we have to have a new meaning every time we read the Quran. Because he said, when meaning repeat itself for someone reciting the Quran, when the meaning is repeating, he said he has not recited it as it should be recited. And the worst is, according to him, this is proof of his ignorance. Ah. So we don't want to be called ignorant, right? So we need to have a new meaning at every reading. This is Ibn Arabi. So according to him, 
The Quran has no single message, but rather a variety of messages. Each one go to the competence and situation of each reader. That's depend on who is the reader. Ibn Arabi insisted that the book should stand up because he saw maybe it was, uh, what is that, not stand up, it's, it was lying down. So he said, the book should stand up after being read. This is the best illumination of the status the Shaykh give to the Quran. He said, others lift up, lift up the book from it bed. Since interpretation on the part of learn or ulama has made the book lie down after it had been standing. The person to whom God has given success comes and makes the book stand up after it had been lying down. So this is what Ibn Arabi warned us to so stand up the book after we read it. But we also should remember According to Ibn Arabi, not only that we can never finish interpreting the book, but actually that none of our interpretation actually has anything to do with the holy one. So interpretation is just interpretation. It is not about the holy one. It is about the interpreter. Who is the interpreter? I give an example here how Ibn Arabi uh, interpret the text, and I think this can help us also to, to understand or how to, what is it, to discuss about discourse that how to live in peaceful uh, coexistence here. For example, Ibn Arabi's commentary on Tawhid. Here, the example. Quran uh, 23 verse 116. Then her exalted be God, the king, the real. There is no God but he. La ilaha illa huwa, but he, the Lord of the noble throne. So here, there is no God, but he, la ilaha illa huwa. Commenting on this verse, Ibn Arabi says, this is the Tawhid of the real, which is the Tawhid of the heness. La ilaha illa huwa, huwiya. Yeah? So the Tawhid of heness. God says we created not the heaven and the earth, and all that between them in play. So for Ibn Arabi, this is the same meaning as his word of the of, of God word. What do you think that we created you only a spot? Hence, according to Ibn Arabi, there is no God but He, La ilaha illa huwa, in above Quranic verse, is a description of the real. Now, two important points that I will show you here. The first is that the Quran reveals multiple dimensions of divine oneness. There are many types of Tawheed. So the Quran discuss more than one type of Tawheed. Tawheed is not only one type, but many types of Tawheed. That's the first one. The second one, Ibn Arabi is making in this belief commentary on Quran 23, 116, is that every element of phenomenal existence is a purposeful expression of the divine oneness because no aspect of creation exists as a play or spot. So for Ibn Arabi, this include diversity of region. It is not an apply. It is a purposeful expression of divine oneness. So Ibn Arabi affirmed that the abundant Quranic references to the plurality of religion, when Quran mentioned about plurality of religion, it is by no means a reference to an accident of faith. But for Ibn Arabi, it is the 19th type of Tawhid. So this is why multiple dimension of divine oneness, multiple, multiple type of Tawhid. And this one is 19th type of Tawhid, which Quran most directly addressed in the following verse. We never send to the messenger before you, Muhammad, except that we reveal to him saying, there is no God but I, la ilaha illa ana, so worship me. The one is la ilaha illa huwa, the other one is la ilaha illa ana. So for Ibn Arabi, the succession of prophet and the messenger, culminating in the messengership of Muhammad, 
which characterize the all orthodox Islamic perspective on the history of revolution is one in which an underlying unity of encounter with one and the only is historically expressed in the multiplicity of form. So in his Futuhat al makiyah he said the path of Allah is all inclusive path upon which all things walk and it, it takes them to Allah. All bring you to Allah. I think Eckhart, I will just miss this for Eckhart interpretation. I will continue on Ibn Rabi. For example, I, this is also another example. When he uh, interpret about the verse Noah, Ibn Arabi make distinction between the form and the essence, the form and the essence of revealed religion. So, the, so Ibn Arabi's interpretation of the scriptural story of Noah is clearly rooted in this distinction. There is a distinction between form and essence of revealed religion. In the Fusus, Bezel of Wisdom, Ibn Arabi said that the people of Noah actually not entirely mystical. For Ibn Arabi, the idol that were worshipped by the people of Noah were in fact the diversity of names understood by Ibn Arabi as the divine name through which human beings become aware of the self-disclosure of God. So people the people of Noah committed the sin of idolatry, according to Ibn Arabi, not because they recognize the divine in plurality form, not because they're shirik or something like that, plurality of form, but because of the ignorance that these forms are not deities in themselves, but rather concrete form of the one God self-manifestation. This is the, this is idolatry. So they sin therefore was in the worship of these form as independent entities apart from God. This is idolatry. Maybe we do the same because we are created, uh, uh, all believers are created by on God actually. This is, this is my other book, uh, when people, when the believers create their own God. Ketika umat beriman mencipta Tuhan, but it is in, again in, in Indonesian language. Okay. So according to Ibn Arabi, what, what is idol? According to Ibn Arabi, the idols are nothing other than God's self-manifestation. For Ibn Arabi, the Quranic verse that we use to interpret and you Lord has decreed that you should worship none other than him. And we interpret it as it is usually understood that you should not worship anything other than God. For Ibn Arabi, he interpret us that whatever you worship, you are thereby not actually worshiping anything other than God. We can read this from the basil of wisdom, the wisdom uh, in the word of Noah. This is Ibn Arabi. So he won us. Ibn Arabi won his fellow Muslim against restricting God to the form of one on belief because we are creating our own God actually. So never restrict God to the form of our own belief. A warning that is entirely in accordance with the trust of so much Quranic discourse. Let me show you here. In Fusus al-Hikam or in Basil of Wisdom, he said, beware of being bound up by a particular creed and rejecting others as unbelief. Try to make yourself a prime matter for all form of religious belief. God is greater and wider than to be confined to any particular creed to the exclusion of others. For he says, for God says, wherever you turn, there is the face of God. This is what Ibn Arabi said. So for Ibn Arabi, true Muslim is a person who recognizes God in all revelation, all revelation. So turn your attention to what we have mentioned and put into practice. Then you will give, give divine it due, and you will be one of those who are fair to what they Lord in knowledge of him. For God is exalted high above and entering under delimitation. He cannot be tied Dawned by one form rather than the another. 
From here, you will come to know the all inclusiveness of felicity for God creatures and the all embracingness of the mercy which come for everything. This is Ibn Arabi word. So this is another example. That's why I use mysticism or Sufism to be uh, what is it, as a discourse uh, that can help us to peace, uh, to, to live in peaceful harmony. Mysticism or Sufism is more for counter extremism. Why? Because this new mode which focus on spirituality, Sufism, mysticism is focused on spirituality, has the advantage of placing primary emphasis on various modes of religious experiences rather than an express doctrinal formulation. We are not focusing on doctrinal formulation, but we are focusing on various modes of religious experiences. This is why mysticism can be a mode for counter extremism. Why? Not only are the finer point of doctrine sometimes difficult to understand, but they also have generally been used as the very means to make claim of absolute and exclusivist truth, and therefore alienate believers of one tradition from those of another. Religious experience, however, this is what Sufism and Muslim focus on. While difficult to define and convey in words, has an immediacy to which most religious people can relate. How? When two people engage each other in a discussion of each one spiritual experience, they must together create a common discourse by which the experience of one is interpretable to the other. So when these two accept the challenge of comparing their spiritual experiences, they are not necessarily born by specific of doctrinal formulation and system, which by nature distinguish and differentiate what is orthodox from what is not orthodox, what is heterodox. Yeah. But they are together creating a common discourse based on the implicit assumption that at least to some degree, they common humanity. This is what I think uh, you mentioned about ethicality, not only spirituality, but ethicality. The, here, their common humanity will reveal commonalities of spiritual experience. The point here is not to argue what uh, Rudolf Otto, for example, and others who follow him, uh, uh, that he is right or who follow him is right, that there is a common pre-linguistic experience of holy at all the core of religion. But here, it is to suggest that the process of comparing ideas about any aspect of human experience assumes a basis of commonality, however narrow, upon which the common discourse of analysis can be built. That's why mysticism or Sufism can be a mode for counteracting activism. So this is what Nasser, Said Hussein Nasser also mentioned, Sufism can be as an antidote to extremism. Sufism can be seen as a way of life and has the potential to counter Islamic extremism and play a vital role for much new religious reform. This is what Said Hussein Nasser said. Sufism is the most powerful antidote to the religious radicalism called fundamentalism, as well as the most important source for corresponding to the challenge posed by modernism. Beside that, Sufism or Islam of love and peace, because the doctrine of Sufi is sul haikul, that is total peace. I think this is related to what we want here. Total peace and peace with all. The Sufi's God is not one to be feared, but to be loved. So God is seen by Sufi as ma'shuk, the beloved. So the relationship between Sufi and God is love first and beloved. So the relationship between God and Sufi is the relationship of a lover and a beloved. Rabia Adawiya, a Muslim woman mystic, once reported to have said, I am so absorbed in love of God so that I have no time to hate Satan. This is what Rabia said. Where there is no hatred, there is no conflict. Indeed, violence never ceases through hatred. It is only through love that is ceased. And the essence of nonviolent is love. Out of love, 
and a willingness to act selflessly, strategies, tactic, and technique for non-violent struggle arise naturally, will arise naturally. So that why I will close this from Ibn Arabi also, from the mystic. Plurality can be learned from the story in the Bible and also in the Quran that Moses as a baby was made by God to refuse the milk of all but his own mother. I think all of you know about this, right? Moses only won the milk from his own mother. So here, my Sheikh, Sheikhuna Al-Akbar, an Andalusian Sufi, Ibn Arabi, he tells the story and then he add the verse. For each of you, we appointed Shir'ah wa min Hajj, a refill law and a way. Shir'ah, a refill law, min Hajj, a way. This is the Quran. So, Sheikh continue by saying that the milk signifies that way, which provide the sustenance for the laws prescribed to all people, just like the branches of the trees can only feed from their root. This is why Moses only won his, his mother's milk. But this is what he said. I quote from Kazemi. The fact that it was only his mother milk that could nourish Moses did not signify that the milk of other mother was not, was not nutritious. So the fact that one always satisfy one on religious need does not signify that other ways are intrinsically incapable of providing for religious need of their own respective communities. So the problem of religious knowledge is an individual need of every religious community. So no one has the right to force another. Here, religion of the world are no more self-sufficient, no more independent, no more isolated than individual of our nation. Horizon are wider, danger are greater, no religion is an island. We all, we are all involved with one another. So spiritual betrayal of part of us, part of one of us affect the faith all of us. This is from Casimo. No religion is an island. And then I will continue with Rumi here. Be like a compass. Stand firm on your one foot, well established in the center of the circle. That is believe in love of God. And travel with your other foot with the people of 72 nations of different race, different color, different religion, different ideologies, with very few cultural personalities. Rumi said, be so tolerant that your heart become white like the ocean. Become inspired with faith and love for others. Love all creation because of all the creator. And then offer a hand to those in trouble and be concerned about everyone. As long as you remain in yourself, you are particle. But if you get united with everybody, you are mine. You are an ocean. All spirit are one and all bodies are one. There are many languages in the world in meaning all are the same. If you break up the cup, water will be unified and will flow together. I think that's it. Hope it will be beneficial. So thank you. Let's discuss. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Abatun, for your beautiful uh, insights and presentation. Um, there is, we see that Professor Osman Bakr is online. Maybe uh, we open the floor to Professor Osman Bakr to say a word, please. Prof. Osman? No, I don't, I don't have a... You don't have nothing to say? <laughs> Okay. Is, uh, thank you, uh, Professor um, Safatul, for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Ustad Osman. Yeah, I, I wish to I be able to come to ISTEC, but uh, inshallah, next time. Okay. Thank you. And we, we really hope you also, uh, you and Professor uh, Abdul Aziz and all scholars here can visit us also in Indonesia here sometime. 
we, we, we welcome you all. Okay, maybe I can conclude here that coexistence, the coexistence and religious moderation framework that um, Sufism has designed is, is holistic, is more holistic because it touches the areas of tolerance, you know, gentle love and mercy. And um, in a way, it sees rationalism as somehow creating um, radicalism. So the framework, in a way, is is um, is diverse in nature because it embraces the a natural inclination of man, which exists in every man. Which in Sufism is seen as the phases of life in a spiritual journey. So the actual barrier that actually keeps us from arriving to our absolute objective um, is ourselves. Uh, this is where purification is needed, and one needs to be holistic. Where the method is called, uh, as as said that uh, by uh, Professor is what the do. And Sufism is a journey back to man himself, and this is what we need in the modern world because we begin to forget ourselves in the modern world. Okay, um, if anyone have any questions, we have one uh, online uh, from Hamid. So is yeah. it Dr. Hamid? Dr. Um, yeah. uh, it was a, a very, I should say, a very refreshing lecture today. And I am thankful to Stock for organizing such uh, lecture. I feel that uh, this approach needs a uh, you know, revival because almost all our great scholars of the past, they were spiritually oriented. Even as I have said last time in the lecture at Stock that even Ibn Taymiyyah, he was also spiritually oriented, but later on the fundamental, the wave of fundamentalism has just devastated this approach. And uh, uh, I feel that we need revival of this approach. And, but I say that uh, since uh, the nature of uh, the Muslim movement's agenda in modern times was political in nature or ideological in nature, and that did not find any room for such uh, spiritual and accommodate to inclusive approach. So how we can revive this approach in modern times, uh, which is culturally also very much relevant to our needs and needs of the world, because nowadays there is a lot of uh, materialistic uh, tendency which is growing, as well as consumerism and such type of uh, theories and philosophies are emerging. And whereas we find that uh, Muslims are not playing any important role to stem these tides, uh, if they want to do this, there is only possibility that through spiritual approach to the problems the world is facing, that can help us a great deal and make our image better and make us to play the role of as a dais, as our past uh, scholars and moments were just playing. So this is my comment, and I just I want your response for this you know, question. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Hamid. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah. and, and we really need this approach. And I think, uh, 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 as I mentioned before, that there are three elements of origin. And unfortunately, actually, we just more focus on the historical institutional. So maybe we need these three elements to be implemented. So we are not just focusing on just historical institutional, but also what about we also develop uh, intellectual and uh, speculative and also a mystical or spiritual or, or, or super, um, um, mystical, what is it, element. So that we are not just a big in, in what is it, in the community or big or very good in the building, but also very good in our intellectual, but also in our uh, uh, spiritual. And this can also uh, be done by, uh, of course, this is education, right? So uh, we need to well inform about our own tradition. Because as I mentioned before, that, that one of the, the, what is that, the cause of conflict is we are, because we are not well informed about our own tradition. We are not well informed. Maybe we just, uh, uh, what is a new little or next to nothing. If we, we will inform about our own tradition, for example, about the possibility of uh, a different interpretation, I think this also will, what is it, help us 
how to face, how to challenge other people, how to face other people, other perspective, other religious tradition. So we will not just saying that, oh, this is my, uh, what is it, my Greek interpretation and your interpretation is wrong. We, we are not do, uh, doing like that. So uh, we we accept other possibilities, or maybe your, pos your interpretation is like this, but there is another interpretation. So this is what we call tolerant, uh, uh, that I, I uh, even though I pass it, uh, uh, but that's actually, we, we can, what is it, uh, uh, accept that there are differences, there are other perspectives from other people. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Yeah. Okay, actually, uh, I think everybody in English who uh, understand that um, we take this example to all nations from time to other. So, if you look at the uh, the historical um, origin of all valid religions, all came from God, they all are direct message. But yet, the reality is. It happens in history, there are divisions, divisions in understanding, division of thoughts. And this is what we are taught. Uh, actually, from, from if you, if you, your mindset is the building uh, evolution, you, you think about this idea of people who speak students and all that, and then as they get more advanced, they believe in monotheism. But if you go to the basic in religion, everything starts from monotheism. It's an only different liberation that began to worship and they define other things, right? Okay, so in that sense, we accept that all valid religions are authentic in origin, but yet they are degradations. And that to me is a real they are degradations. So despite being tolerant, we must also uh, uh, understand the fact that they are things that need to be purified. So between that, the idea of being tolerant to other religions, but yet the understanding, they are mistakes, they are mistakes, really. you can't say about it, people of Kufur and all that, and people who are led astray. This is a fact, it's not just about being tolerant, but this is a fact. So how do you negotiate that? Being tolerant and yet trying to tell uh, people what should be the right fact, not the, uh, the what they will, you will understand that you will believe until you become the knowledge of the integration of God. Okay, uh, please accept my apology. Could you please, uh, what is it, uh, mention a little bit about the question because you know you are not in in the in front of of the computer, so it is not really clear what you are talking about because you are in the group, so it is difficult for us. Uh, who are in the in the computer? I mean, uh, by Zoom, I can understand what you are saying. So, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you talk about the authenticity, and uh, even though there are uh, uh, that all religions are authentic, but we need to purify it. Or what? What, what is that? Okay, okay. This is this this idea of intolerance is the acceptance that uh, there are different views of approaching and understanding the reality of God. Yeah. Yes. Okay, in Islam itself, you read the Quran. Uh, every religion, every religion in fact comes from God. Islam itself means peace, only peace. The, the word Islam is Arabic, but if you achieve peace by your practice, you are Muslim. If you, if you, yeah, but uh, in that sense, we can follow them in any religion, in fact. But the fact is, they are deep definition. Definition thing, okay, let's say, uh, uh, okay, I'm not the Christianity here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. we, we believe in the proper group of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, but we never raise him after the divinity. No, we never accept him. God, in fact, if you are, if you are, uh, uh, if you give me to be they don't believe really in such a thing, they don't believe really the Holy Ghost, and it's such a that is such a creed in Christianity itself. So, uh, it's being modern means that you should also accept that, uh, whatever. Uh, all the people is put a string, you must also be separate, or there must be some way of, you know, being nice to people in the government, but yet, you must, if you're able to tell truth, you must be able to speak to a truth, because you can have a truth that is like, what most you can put here and there only to accommodate the privilege. You must have, 
you must have an ultimate thing. And it is within that very slide, you're saying that being in the middle of the compass, you are in the middle of the compass, okay, you can set your own here in 72, 72 different directions. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, that doesn't mean that P tolerance means that you must accept everything. There must be somewhere an individual between being tolerant and yet sticking to a frame and yet addressing all the different thoughts. How do you go about this? That is complicated. Okay. okay. Uh, please accept my apology if I understand it correctly. So at least like this, uh, what I can say to you is like this. Yes, we have a different perspective. There are different concepts of God, for example, you understand the strict monotheism, the Tawheed. I mentioned before, Ibn Arabi, there are many types of Tawheed, right? Tawhid Huwiyah, Tawhid Ananiya, and diversity actually also that 19 type of Tawhid. That's what I mentioned. But uh, for, your, for your question, for your, uh, what is that, for your, what you are saying is like this. So you said uh, we need to have a certain goal, right? So let me, uh, uh, let me speak like this. Okay, we understand we have differences. Differences. Uh, but the most important here is that I mentioned to you what we mean by toleration. We don't need to force them. Remember the Quran said, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. When we say Ud'u, what it mean by Ud'u? Would all call to the way of God. Call the people will follow if they want it. But if they don't want it, why should you force them? So would all mean just call, but never force, right? So that's the, the so when we are talking about mission, da'wah, for example, so udo actually is just calling. Calling. If they want it, it's okay. If they don't want, it's okay. God Himself said, and took me no, okay, and takfuru, go ahead. So because we are human beings, we uh, God give us. Choices. Uh, you can choose between these two. But coming back to this about, uh, about the differences, I think, okay, we just understand, okay, we are different, but we still can live together peacefully. I can mention to you, uh, because we are talking about mystical uh, way, yeah, for, uh, for a mystical way to, uh, to, to live peacefully. I can also mention, I don't know if we have in Islamic tradition, but there are uh, uh, in Catholic tradition, maybe you all know the people call his name is Charles, Charles de Foucault. Yeah, not myself Foucault, but Charles de Foucault. He was a devout Catholic contemplative, right? And he stayed in North Africa. He founded a new religious order in South Africa. He lived actually in Muslim world all his life. But rather than try to comfort the Muslim, he tried to become a kind of witness to Christianity to them. Shuhada, I think in Islamic tradition. We want to be shuhada. So he want to be a kind of witness to Christianity to them and to befriend them as people following another person of his religion and the message that come from God. This is Charles de Foucault. I think if we understand this, again, this is my interpretation, okay? So interpretation is okay because uh, uh, God, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, speak to, to people. Or the word of God speak to people never cease. Yeah. So that's when you read the Quran, it should be uh, what is a new meaning every reading. So so this is what I I read. So when 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 Quran said udo'u, 
that doesn't mean that you have to convert them to Islam. So, for example, you would go to Christianity, for example, it doesn't mean you have you need to convert Christian into Islam. But the O is calling, calling that one, and then sabili robbi. In Christ, in 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 mystical tradition, the part to God, Ibn Arabi said, the part to God is as many as human soul, as many as human soul. So how many human soul? There are too many human soul. So the part to God, there are there are many part to God. Right, so if the Quran says the way of God, the way of God are so many. Not only your way, not only my way. There are so many ways. I think this is what I understand. Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, who is the who is the one who asked me? <laughs> Sorry, I I don't uh, what is it answering. You. That's what I understand that. Yeah, as you should say, you know, tolerate the difference and that it's not completely accepting you know, the principles of many, many religions, but it's not about, you know, uh, two diverse things uh, cannot be sit in one place. It's not about, you know, the formula of logic it's yeah. or philosophy. It is about acceptance of different journeys yes. towards truth. Yeah. And one person is saying uh, in, in Zoom, we don't need to confuse spirituality with Sufism always, as long as spirituality was revolving around moral principles and high objectives of self uh, realization, there was no problem. However, when some people make Sufi thought to replace the Talhidic well, Tanchao with man made metaphysics, there was a problem in the approach, according to Sheikh Ahmed Sahili at Kabbalah and other Islamic scholars. Okay, you have any other questions? We have one in Zoom. So far as Sufism emphasizes that human inner self is capable of knowing and experiencing the divine reality directly, some critics allege that this approach confers a somewhat secondary status to religious scripture. Your thoughts on this matter? Please go. Um, from Bibi Ishara. So what is the question again? The question was, uh, so far the Sufism emphasizes that human inner self is capable of knowing and ex experiencing the divine reality directly. Some mm -hmm. critics allege that this approach confers a somewhat secondary status to religious scripture. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, maybe I can see from, uh, this is from the, from the, what is that, from the chatting, right? The participant. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me see again, chatting here. We don't need confuse. Oh, so far, Sufism emphasized that human inner self is capable of knowing and experiencing the divine reality directly. Some critics allege that this approach confers a somewhat secondary status to religious scripture. Okay. Religious scripture, again, we are also doing interpretation. Right? When you see it, uh, this is what we call hermeneutic, the art of interpretation. Even though you said that this is from, from religious scripture, this is from the Quran. But Quran, as Ibn Arabi, the word of the Quran has an infinite meaning. Infinite. So, for me, I don't want to see that this is secondary, this is primary, because all of us actually is trying to understand the word of God, right? So using a, a, a Junaid, for example, uh, when we are interpreting the tradition, that depends on who we are. So Junaid said, the color of the water is of its of it container, the color of the water of its container. So water actually is colorless, right? But that's become colorful, that's depend on the container. What is our container? Our container is our experience, our thought, our intellectual, our understanding, our contact, and many things that influence us. That's how we interpret the tradition. This is what tonight say. 
And if we use the word of uh, uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, for example, he said like this. If you pour the ocean into a jug, the ocean, let, let, let imagine that these ocean are the scripture, right? If you pour the ocean into a jug, how much it can hold? So you want to understand God, you want to understand the scripture, you want to understand the word of God. That means you want to put this word of God into your, what is that, uh, into your jug, into your perspective. So what you get, you only have one jug. So that only your perspective. That's why, so this is what, what, this is what Rumi said, if you pour the ocean into a jug, how much can hold? We only have one jug. So that's why we need to learn from other jug. We need to learn from other interpretation, other people interpretation in order to have more than only one jug. So we have another jug. We learn from other jug. I think this is what I try to do. Okay. That's what I can say about what you said. That's my perspective. Bibi Esrat, yeah? Bibi Esrat, okay. Thank you, Bibi. Okay, we have one more question here. Yeah. Just click in the Oh, no, that's it. Okay, um, others? From the floor, do you have any questions? More discussions, comments? Professor, do you have something to say? Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Prof. For... I think Mohammed is in Saab. He will ask something, maybe. I saw he's, he's, uh, he, he would like to say something. Mohammed okay. in Saab? You want to say something? Uh, yes, as well. uh, Can you that, unmute your your what is it your mic, please? Oh, okay. It's still still mute. Can you unmute, please? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Hey, Assalamualaikum. Uh, yes, I want to ask, uh, Prof. Uh, mentioned uh, that uh, God, uh, way of God, really so many. Uh, yes. Uh, we're uh, speaking. I, I could not listen. I could know, not hear. You close your mic there and just speak openly. Okay. The system is clear. Okay, go ahead, Mohammed Insaf. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, just you mentioned that the uh, way of God, uh, maybe so many ways. Uh, so, what does it mean by uh, Sirat al Mustaqim? And uh, Professor Allah said uh, when he mentioned 73 groups, Ma ana alayhi waskhan. Could you please explain this? What is another? What is the second one? Sorry? Ma ana alayhi waskhan. Alayhi was happy. Oh, you mean the, the, the first, what is that, that I, about, about uh, the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, the, this is, Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Salat wa salam. Oh. I don't realize that 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 there will be a problem for that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, I hope that there is a salat was salam uh, uh, to all these uh, uh, for, for the Prophet Muhammad and uh, and his family and his ashabi sahabat. So a. Sahaba, that's depend on we understand and how we understand Sahaba, right? So maybe for for what is it? Shi'i, they will not consider 
someone a sahaba but for sunni there are sahaba so but i don't want to to deal about that yeah so that's depends so it's okay uh, you can understand sahaba only for this one uh, and sahaba for that one and i'm sunni so you understand that right muhammad insaf and then the the, the first one siratul mustaqim yeah siratul mustaqim what is Sirat al mustaqim That also depends on how you understand that. Again, this is about the art of interpretation. The art of hermeneutic. This how you do hermeneutic. What it means, Sirat. Not only Sirat al mustaqim Even when you mentioned about Islam, yeah. Let me show you. Let me share with you, for example, about the meaning of islam yeah i think uh, i don't know when when ustad a uh, ustad uh, bakar was there in in uh, in london for example i think so i i mentioned about what it's mean by muslim yeah so I will show you what it's meant by Muslim. If an Islam, there are many kind of, of interpretation about Islam. So I meant I, I can show you here, for example, one. Yeah, let me show you here one. The that's why I I use new window. Yeah, maybe because it is. It is not all. So this is, I said, new window in Islam. Islam as original and humanity. Even Islam, let alone talk about Surat al-Mustaqim. Even Islam, I said here, I just want to, to show you here the Muslim within. We are talking the inat Muslim in every human being. So Surat al-Mustaqim might, might be also... Uh, what is a different interpretation like what we call by Muslim M capital M or non capital M so the Quran says in uh, in the first seven Allah to be Rabbikum this is what I call the day of Allah and then every human being is born Muslim so what Muslim said and also the Quran in other Quran Makana Ibrahimu Yahudian wala Nasronian walakin Hanifan Muslima Muslim again. So what it mean by Muslim then? Right. So that also Muslim has different meaning here. So what is or who is Muslim? Who is what is Islam? If we so, we, we 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 would like to interpret in Nadina in the Lohil Islam. The legend before before Allah is Islam. What is Islam? Is, is Islam the religion that we have here, the organized religion, or submission to his will? But if we say that Islam is the religion that we have now as an organized religion, so why there is a verse is maka na Ibrahimu Yahudian wala Nasronian wala Hanif and Muslima. So something like that, right? And if you use also and you open another Quran, there are many, many verses that mention about Islam, not as organized religion. But here, Islam in the era of Noah, for example, umirtu an akuna minal muslimin. Muslim, right? Minal muslimin. In the era of Abraham, you see me, Hanif and Muslima, Hanifa. You see me, I hear. Goyro baitim minal muslimin. So I think this kind of stuff. So that why I said that that depend on how you interpret it. So that what we call the the art of interpretation. How you interpret that, and I uh, propose mystical hermeneutic, mystical interpretation because. With this interpretation, there are many possibilities that you will get new meaning at every reading, and this will help us how to live in peaceful existence. 
So we are not imposing your interpretation to others. Because that actually is interpretation. That's actually, this is not what God said. This is what you said. You interpret what God said. And that's your interpretation is colored by what Arkun said, the aesthetic of reception, sociological, cultural, and intellectual circumstances that will influence your interpretation. So, so that's what I can say. Please accept my apology if that not uh, answer your question, okay? Okay, uh, maybe let me conclude before I hand the session to Papaji. So religions including- Sorry, Mama Insafa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe I can conclude before I give my, uh, the session to uh, Aziz. So religions, including Islam, are interpreted or expressed um, in a different way, and Sufism has uh, expressed it in, in an artistic way. That's how you know we paint a picture, and not it is not verbally said, but beautifully sensed through the feeling and the heart. So it does not uh, actually uh, negate uh, other methods of expressing love uh, to God or to truth. And method is, is different from objective, and mm. is about method in moving towards the peaceful um, existence. And I yep. found one uh, saying from Bumi, uh, it is very beautiful saying that all religions, all this singing uh, is one song. The differences are just illusion and vanity. The sun look uh, light, uh, the sun's light looks a little different on this wall than it does on that wall. And a lot different on this other, but it's still one light. Okay. Okay. Uh, that, that, the, uh, if remember again, I think one more. There is an interesting uh, story when uh, we are talking about Rumi when he mentioned about the story of Moses and Sephora, right? So how that's actually also how that uh, illuminate uh, the differences. So the Moses actually is exoteric tradition. And the support actually is from esoteric tradition, right? Or uh, 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 Hidir and Moses also. So the, this is Moses when uh, uh, once upon the time Moses just walk around and then there was a support, uh, 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 what is it, praying to God, oh God, um, uh, who are you? Let me see you so I can serve you a coffee, I can serve you a meal, I can uh, brush your hair or something, something like that. And then Moses said, "Hey, you are Muslim, You are your 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 what? Is it? Your father is Muslim, Your father is Muslim. How come you pray like that? God is not what you see. But then, because he is a he is a Nabi, he is a Rasul, and this separate is just separate. So he moved away into into the desk, into the what is it? Into the uh, into a certain place. And then the story, according to Rumi." Uh, uh, there is a sound that's that usually interpreted as the sound from God and one to Moses and said to Moses, Moses, your duty is to make people close to me, come to me, not to move away from me. What you just did actually is actually is moving that support away from me. And God said, Whatever they say, however, uh, what is uh, however they they pray, whatever they used to pray, that is it is okay for me. I can understand all. The most important thing is the burning heart to me. I think that's the most important thing, burning heart. So that spirituality. That's the story from from a from Rumi. I think that's also will uh, what is that a. Uh, make this more valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. I think that uh, you had uh, actually break the, the, the Bhagavadism in, in many of our hearts here. And um, we thank you very much for the insight and presentation. Um, I think I should uh, hand the session to Papaziz. Maybe you have something to say. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Th thank, thank you, Dr. Ayn. Uh, first of all, let's thank our Professor uh, Shafaatun for uh, her informative and uh, a kind of uh, enlightening uh, lecture, uh, though uh, maybe we disagree uh, with uh, 
some of the ideas that have been uh, mentioned in the lecture, uh, but I think in the in the overall uh, perspective of Islam, of exchange of ideas and tolerance and uh, uh, trying to interpret the text of the Quran, I think uh, we can uh, tolerate each other and um, uh, exchange ideas. Uh, I believe and trust that what has been uh, mentioned, uh, this mystical hermeneutics uh, or Sophie hermeneutics, it's not actually a uh, new in the West. Uh, that's the that's the trend in the last 50 to 60 years, leaning more towards the mystical and the Sophie uh, approaches to reinterpreting the text, the Quran, the history. And I think the masters of these things in our history are like Ibn al-Arabi or Sahrawardi or Rumi or this. Uh, but this is one, just one uh, stream. Uh, of the uh, Islamic thought and civilization. What is crucial and important is the Sharia, ah, is the Mizan. When you have uh, a standard, when you have a criteria, when you have a manhaj that guides you in your tasawwuf or in your theology or in whatever idea you bring, then you are really thinking objective and scientific. But when you just leave it to the interpretation, let's say whatever the Sufi uh, scholar uh, will carry or will give you of experience uh, of Ibn al-Arabi or any other one, it's actually his own experience, his own way of relating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he says that there are millions of types of tawheed, that's his, his, his interpretation. And in the end, saying all this to tell the world that uh, we should have tolerance, we should tolerate each other, uh, we should not focus on the, uh, the organized religion. You know, this movement of mystic uh, uh, hermeneutics, they have a phobia about the well-structured Sharia or the well-structured religion, for example. But I think we don't have any problem because our interpretation of the Sharia or of the Quran or of the Sunnah or the Islamic uh, Aqidah, actually that Aqidah, that Sharia is the same Sharia that tells us to respect others' ideas, others' views, to respect other Milan and Nihal and other religions. It is the same Sharia and religion that teaches us that, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ يَا إِيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ Acknowledge that kafirun exists, and they have their own religion, and they have their own way of thinking, and they have their own, and God himself brought all their discourse, discourse in the Quran, وَلَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ is there any tolerance more than this with the unbeliever or with the atheist or with the uh, other uh, person? Even the Quran says, you have your being, use the term, deenukum. Waliya, deen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in الدين عند الله الإسلام ومن يبتغي غير الإسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه now you come and you explain what does mean Islam as peace or tolerating or this so that's your interpretation no problem but in the end the religion of Islam is the religion which Allah it's the religion of Adam and Noah and Isa and Musa, and Yaqub, and Yusuf, and all of them. In the end, it's Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. So what is Islam? It's worship, it's unity of God, it's Tawheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ 
we have sent to you the book with the truth, al-haq, musabbiqan lima bayna yadayna. Acknowledge and respect and accept all the religion which was sent to Musa, to Isa, to all. Musabbiqan lima bayna yadayna. But this is the only place in the Quran where this word was used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ So you want to know Christianity or the real Christianity, it's in the Quran. You want to know the real Judaism, it's in the Quran. You want to know the real religion that has been sent to Nuh or Shits of Abraham or all, all, all this, it's all in the Mizan. It's all in the Sharia. It's all here. And that's the Sharia which tells all Muslims in the world that no compulsion in religion. La ikraha fi din. There is no enforcement of anyone to accept the religion of Islam. It's the religion of aql. It's the religion of freedom. It's the religion of accountability. It's the religion of respect, of tolerance, of love, of compassion, of unity, of rahmatan lil alameen. And more and more, and adl, and all justice, and all equality. That's Islam. But when the practices of Muslims does not match this, or does not reflect the tolerance of Islam, or the freedom of Islam, that doesn't mean that Islam is not right. So Islam is that your religion which is meant to unify. And the, the same ayah says, Judge among them with due respect and respecting them with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That's the big problem of what we are facing today. It's all about hawa. It's all about desires and grips. When you, whether you are a Sufi or a Faqih or a Mufassir or a Muhaddith or whatever, it's all about following the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we just leave it to our own interpretation, our own understanding, our, there is no mizan, there is no guide, there is no criteria. And that's why we are ending with postmodernism. No God, no truth, no absolute, no, in the pretext of freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of all these things. Why I'm saying this, while you are interpreting and discussing and, and, and enriching the discourse and encouraging aqal and encouraging understanding, we have always to have a standard or what the Quran says, the mizan. If you want to be mutasawwif or sufi, it's great, go ahead. But you do the tasawwuf which is according to the revealed wahi or to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. That's why under Islam, we have under the history of Islam, we have this spectrum of the Sufi who is talking about wihdat uh, al-hulul, uh, hulul uh, and all this, and the Sufi who is following the Sharia and the normal teachings of Islam, and he's living in great peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without all this philosophical mysticism and philosophical interpret interpretation of things. So you can do that, but Sharia is meant to be for everybody, for a philosopher, for a scholar, for a mystic person, for a halim. That's why Imam Shafi'i, that's one of the guru of ilm sharia the man who respects akhlaq, ethics, spirituality, mysticism, and all this. He says that this sharia was sent by Allah subhanahu uh, because as you know, all in Imam al-Ghazali, al-Juwayni, al Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, they talk about maqasid sharia when it comes to Imam Shatibi, talk about two things. Maqasid al-Sharia, which is the five values which we all know, protection of religion, man, wealth, aql, and protection of aql. Here where 
all the great things which our professor today was mentioning and respecting the, the, the people and haqal and thinking. But Imam Shatibi talks about another maqasid. maqasid. He says, maqasid sharia are these five, but there is not maqasid sharia only, but the maqasid al-mukallaf. Maqasid al-mukallaf. You, as a khalifa on earth, what is your maqasid? What is your maqsad? And if we don't understand this, that's why we see all these streams of ideas and views that sometimes go against the core of the Sharia itself. Imam Shatibi says, Maqsad al mukallaf is to free man, to free man from his own desires and grips. Okay, to free man from his own desire, hawa, al hawa, that's what causes most of what you see in the world. To free man from his own desires and grips. Look at the beauty, with his own choice. As he is created by God as a servant without his, without his choice. When Allah created you as Adam and created this as plant and this animal, you don't have a choice. But when it comes to your action, to your fi'al, to your amal, your choice, your freedom is number one in Sharia. And yukhrija al-abda, okay, to free man from his own desires and grips with his own choice. That's why brothers and sisters, uh, what we have heard today is another stream of uh, interpreting and understanding the religion, understanding Islam, uh, but it's the Sophie mystic way. And, and you, as you know, in the Sophie mystic way, there are many ideas, some of them acceptable, some of them are not acceptable. What to me, what is much more important is the mizan of Sharia that guides the Sophie, guides the Faqih, guides the Usuli, guides the Muhaddi, and guides all these people. That's where we need to understand the, the real deep worldview of Islam, which is actually for all these great values which we have heard today from our professor and from other professors. But once you lose the mizan of Sharia, you are already in another spectrum. You are already in, other, in another level of discussion. You have the freedom to do that. But what is important is whether what we are doing is in accordance with the criteria or the mizan or the manhaj of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh acknowledges the, uh, the other religions and other uh, things which come before, but muhayminan means dominating by manhaj uh, on these things. So brothers and sisters, this is really another great lecture, which I am sure those who are in the YouTube, Zoom or here, and those who will hear it later on, raised a lot of important questions. It might not give you direct answers, but the questions posed here, are very crucial for us to develop in my own humble understanding what I call the vicegerent or the istikhlaf mysticism that is in accordance with the Sharia. Because to me, the Sharia is the standard. But I understand Sharia not from what the propaganda of the West wants me to understand from Sharia. I understand it from the core and the real sources and uh, from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is really great in the end. We would like to thank our professor today for all these uh, uh, very important ideas. And I am sure we will invite her uh, once more, many more times to go more in depth and in discussions in these ideas and from the we delve into the real balanced worldview of Islam where we really understand Islam in its beauty and Islam in its balance, Islam in its moderation and wasatiyah, 
Islam in its adal and justice, Islam in its way of life that respects all. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. So, brothers and sisters, uh, in the end, we thank our professor for the great uh, lecture, for the great ideas. We thank you all who are with us here in, and in this Zoom and in other places. And I think before we end our session today and our uh, Istak World Professorial Lecture number 20, I would like to ask uh, our brother Azrul to show the E certificate of appreciation to our professor, uh, which is in the, the screen there. And we will uh, uh, make it in the engraved uh, uh, certificate and we will send it to our professor or we deliver it to her when we invite her to be with us here physically uh, here uh, in Istanbul. Uh, in the end also, I would like maybe uh, uh, if there is no any other thing, I would like to ask uh, to call upon Dr. Nick to give the last dua to bless our uh, session of Ibadah today, session of Ilm today, session of learning to know more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, our respected moderator, respected Dean of his tech, Professor Abdul Aziz Baruth, honorable speakers, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, let us pray to Allah for grant us the blessing, uh, Rahmah in our life. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Ashraf Al Anbiya Wal Mursaleen, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in. اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ونسألك رزقا طيبا ونسألك عملا متقبلا اللهم إنا نسألك من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعوة لا يستجاب لها Oh Allah, we are seeking refuge in you from a knowledge that is not beneficial. We are seeking refuge from a heart that does not tremble, from a soul that is not satisfied, from a dua that is not answered. Oh Allah, inspire us with good ideas, protect us from the evil of ourselves, Protect us from any calamities and teach us from your infinite knowledge what we do not know. Glory be to you, O Allah. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. You are truly the all-knowing, the all-wise. O Allah, at this moment, we beg you to keep showing us the path to a fruitful discussion and guide us in removing our shortcomings, which we beg you, O Allah, for your mercy and forgiveness. O oh Allah, we make you to make our requests as the best of our supplications. We beg you for the best success, for the best duty and the best rewards. Make us patient in our action. Make our skill heavy with rewards. Patient in our works, dedicated in our jobs, knowledgeable in our fields, humble in our behavior, strong in our faith, compassionate to our subjects, and tolerance to our differences. Rabbana aftah baynana wa bayna qawmina bil haqqi wa anta khayr al-fatihin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adab al-nar. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma wa tafarruqana min ba'anhi tafarruqan ma'asuma. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم حنا ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, with this we thank you all والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته
Okay. Well, you can so you are here, we have uh, some refreshment here for our people. Well, thank sure. you, Prof. Thank you, everyone on the Zoom and YouTube. Thank you for uh, your patience and all the time you have given to us today. Uh, thank you, Prof. Shafatun. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, keep in touch, inshallah. Thank you, Ustad. I, I agree that we should, we should <laughs> disagree, right? Inshallah, inshallah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. We will see you soon in Istak, inshallah. Inshallah. Amin, inshallah. Shukran okay. jazilan. Shukran Istak, shukran. Akramakumullah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum for all. Stay safe and keep healthy. Inshallah.